And I'll now look to the Treasurer-elect, Lalivad Lamani, Trinity College, to open the case for the opposition. To corrupt something is to do more than changing the mere essence or nature of that thing, but to strip it of its utility, its functions and its pleasures. Much of what ails our modern life is the fact that we reduce the value of a human being to a number, a salary or consumer power. And the first to be thrown overboard tend to be the elderly, the disabled and anyone not tightly integrated into the global supply chain. Rather than a corruption, social media is, if anything, a counterweight to the ongoing devaluation of human lives. Rather than being separate, virtual and real worlds, the fact that online and offline spheres are tightly integrated is exactly why people can attempt to break away from the constraints in their offline lives by hacking their connectivity through their online interactions. Can't be close to your family because your, do your job took you to the other end of the planet. You can still share updates on Facebook. Can't find people who share your hobbies and interests. Surely there is a community online. Can't get your voice heard through conventional media outlets because your government is censoring news of your protest. You can tweet photos of it. With a few clicks, we're able to share in the life experiences of other people, whether they're old colleagues, friends from high school, or people we've not yet had the opportunity to meet offline, and might never have encountered if it wasn't for social media. Online communication can make face-to-face, -face, offline relationships stronger. Parents are able to keep in close contact with their children who are travelling abroad or going away to university. And global friendships are still able to flourish. Amid all this controversy, let, let us not forget what the principal reason for Facebook having over a billion users is. It works. Social media has become an integral part of our daily lives. Over one billion active Facebook users visit the site each day. There are over 500 million tweets per day and around 80 million posts shared on Instagram. The idea of portraying an aesthetic lifestyle has increased Instagram's popularity immensely. More and more people play the like game, using themes and filters to aid them. They enjoy being able to share some of their most cherished moments with their families and friends. Let's take the example of user X. They have a black and white Instagram with the bio, making my life look fun so people think I'm cool. <laughs> Photos include gym poses with the caption, there's no place like home. <laughs> And posts are littered with poses with celebs. You might think I'm referring to the Instagram of One Direction's Harry Styles, but no, I'm actually referring to tonight's first proposition speaker, Jack Simmons. <laughs> Jack is a second year economics and management student, just like myself, and is also a member of the Union Standing Committee. He's someone I actually met in my very first lecture here at Oxford. And around one year ago, he endorsed me on LinkedIn for public speaking, so I'm really <laughs> looking forward to seeing what he makes of my speech tonight. <laughs> it falls on me to introduce all of our proposition speakers this evening, not just our Australian Tinderella. Emma Gannon is the writer of award-winning millennial bible, Girl Lost in the City, and author of Control, Alt, Delete, How I Grew Up Online. As former social media editor of British Glamour and a leading blogger, she's immensely well qualified to speak about the issues tonight's debate aims to discuss. Cherry Healy is a British television presenter who has taken on subjects such as feminism, body image, money and parenting, having even given birth on screen. In addition to her TV work, she is also an incredibly successful journalist and author, having released her first book last year. Mr President, these are your speakers and they are certainly most welcome. Moving on to my first main argument this evening, social media empowers us to feel our interconnectivity and collective consciousness. On November the 8th, discouraged and upset by the outcome of the US election, retired lawyer Teresa Shook set up a Facebook event inviting women to stage a peaceful protest in Washington the day after the presidential inauguration. The Hawaiian resident wanted the Trump administration to know on its very first day in office that women's rights are human rights. By the time she woke up on November the 9th, over 10,000 people had expressed their desire to attend the rally. Soon after, women across, across the country began setting up similar events. On January the 1st, 21st, a day after President 
Trump's inauguration, over 500,000 people, including many celebrities, arrived at the nation's capital to stage a peaceful but, pro but forceful protest. An additional 408 marches took place in cities across the United States and 168 more in 81 countries worldwide. According to some estimates, over 4.8 million women, men and children took to the streets this Saturday. It's clear to see how social media can be used as a force for good and empower individuals and communities to instigate social change. Social media can help disarm social stigmas. For example, the Sticks and Stone cam Stones campaign uses Twitter to reduce stigmas surrounding mental health and learning disabilities. New apps and tools add to the strength of powerful change movements. Launched earlier this month, Mark Yourself Unsafe is a web app that allows Black Lives Matter organizers modelled after Facebook safety check, to allow black social media users to symbolically mark themselves as unsafe in locations throughout the United States. The tool serves to highlight the current threats the black community faces across the nation, making it extremely and soberingly clear how racism threatens the safety of black Americans. Social media also facilitates the breaking of glass ceilings and shattering of conventional socio-economic barriers. In a world where only 24 Fortune 500 company CEOs are women, social media is also a powerful tool in helping to empower businesswomen. Being able to connect on social networking sites gives businesswomen an opportunity not readily found offline, especially as social media sites are dominated by women. For example, the website one.org helps African women entrepreneurs connect on social media to help grow their businesses. In fact, it's clear to see how social media is a particularly powerful tool for minority groups in general, whether these groups are those defined by their identity or their interests. Social media equips us with the knowledge needed to become global citizens and communicators. No one can argue with the fact that social media is one of the best ways to stay informed. Social networking sites spread information faster than any other form of, of, any other form of media. Twitter and YouTube users reported the 2012 Colorado theatre shooting before news crews could arrive on the scene. And the Red Cross urged witnesses to tell family members that they were safe via social media outlets. Using social media allows people to follow organizations and causes that they believe in and makes them feel that they are part of something, even if they are not fully integrated into society. In fact, the 74 plus age group is the fastest growing demographic on social media sites. Seniors report feeling happier due to online contact with family and friends. And they also have access to information that, have moved, that has moved online and out of print. Let's take the example of my grandmother. After my grandfather passed away, she lives alone in her house in India. Three of her children live in the USA, whilst the fourth, my mother, lives in the UK. Many of her friends have moved away to live with their children abroad too. It's easy to understand how isolated she sometimes feels. Ten years ago, this isolation would have been incredibly difficult to overcome. In today's world, however, She's managed to learn how to use her iPad and smartphone to keep in touch with her children and grandchildren around the globe. It also helps us to keep up to date with the things that are happening in her life, as well as to check that she's OK. And sometimes, human communication isn't about spending heaps of time in a conversation, and it isn't about fussing over how much time you spend with someone. It's about smiling knowingly at the status of your friend who was 600 miles away. It's about that moment of relief that you feel when your friend posts, I'm all right, everything's fine, after a bomb scare next to their workplace. It's about your ability to express your appreciation and respect for someone who you would never talk to in real life via liking, wowing, or loving their statuses. It's about the solidarity that you foster through the fluid, complex, yet powerful interactions that you get online. Finally, social media makes it easier for us to love and be loved. The world really is getting smaller, and we're now connected to each other both digitally and physically. Social media is just one factor in modern life that can increase the connection in a world that is divided by the vagarities of capitalism, the disengagement of television, and the isolation of suburban sprawl. Tonight's proposition will try to convince you that social media corrupts human interactions by reducing face-to-face -face interactions and disrupting social networks. Data on the matter, however, simply proves them to be wrong. Social media does not, in fact, displace one type of conversation with another. It has instead allowed transition of interaction and social networks to a more effective form. The invention of Facebook does not make you stop speaking to your loved ones in real life. Although it has definitely changed the way that we interact, this change is most definitely not a corruption. 
No one is saying that social media should be or is our main form of communication and interaction, or even that it is a substitute for personal interaction. Above all, it's not up to the proposition, or any of us in fact, to impose a monistic, absolute definition of what makes human interactions valuable. Maybe someone finds communicating online less fulfilling and yet more expedient. We have no right to determine if expediency is a wrong metric to fulfilment, each to their own. Social media certainly isn't perfect, but it's clear that it has the potential to be an incredibly pivotal vehicle for social change and that it has the power to enhance existing interactions and relationships. I'd like to close by thinking again about last Saturday's Women's March. It goes without saying that the extraordinary manner in which it spread around the world would not have happened if social media did not remind us of our collective consciousness and could not have happened without social media's role in organising for action. As I hope I've shown tonight, social media is of particular significance to marginalised communities around the globe, from the elderly to the structurally oppressed groups who led the Women's March. Through its connective power, millions of people came together to march on Saturday, and I really do hope that the networks and friendships formed amongst those who marched will persist in ways that could not have done before, thanks to social media. Sure, this constitutes change, but it's quite the opposite of corruption. I could not be more proud to oppose this motion. Thank you.